John. Good afternoon. This is Dr. John Bennett broadcasting from sunny Miami. Today, we in internetmedicine.com on the M Health Studio, we have the honor of having David Darty of 3G Doctor, uh, and he's uh, I've been following him for a couple of years now uh, on mhealthinsight.com, uh, and he's gonna we're gonna kind of have a free form discussion. Uh, first, we'll introduce the students before we turn it over to Dave. Hello, Diana. Hi. Could you please describe what you do and etc.? Um, I'm currently in a master's program at Larkin University here in Miami. Uh, studying, studying biomedical sciences and uh, looking forward to taking my MCATs pretty soon and going into medical school. You're welcome. Welcome, Diana. Mary Lennies. Well, I'm also I'm going to Larkin um, University to study a master's in biomedical sciences, also studying for the MCAT, and I'm very glad to be here. Okay, Ezra, how are you from Ireland? Hi there, Esan from Trinity College, third year med student, and it's a pleasure to meet you. Yeah, in the backyard of David, almost. Uh, and uh, Marco. Good afternoon, my name is Marco Antonio. I'm from Bolivia. I'm a doctor. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Yeah, Marco is a frequent participant in our shows here. And uh, the main man, Simon, how are you doing, Simon? <laughs> I'm fine, thank you. It's uh, 3 a.m. here in Tokyo. It's an honor to be here. I'm a medical student uh, in Japan and uh, looking forward to the presentation. Thank you. Uh, and Dog's been here from the very start. Good day, David. How are you doing? Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening here in Dublin. Yeah, we're, we're welcome, uh, David. Uh, yeah, I've been follow. I was telling the panelists before we started. I've been following you for years on your blog, and that uh, you're a very honest reporter of what's going on. If you don't like something, you say. Can you please uh, describe your career, how you got started in M Health, uh, etc., and your background? Yeah, the uh, first experience in life was um, that I remember was actually using mobile phones in healthcare. Well, not use, using telephones in healthcare. I was in a, a sick children's hospital uh, with a brother of mine, and um, the, the, I noticed that the doctors made a noise. They sounded as they come up the corridor. And the reason they made a noise is they had money in their pockets, in the bottom of their big, deep white jacket pockets. And I noticed when they told news to parents, they would prefer those coins to the parent. And it was when my mother was given these coins that I was particularly interested because I thought it was money for the sweet shop. But we went out of the ward, down the stairs, and into the lobby of the hospital. And she put them into this incredible machine that was sitting there. And it was literally a, t a, a payphone. But um, I thought, obviously, my mum was wasting the money. And I saw that emotional connection that she was having to our home. Um, and it was a dawning moment for me that, uh, the, you know, this hospital's most powerful piece of technology was out there where all the smokers were in the lobby. And, um, you know it was accessing for 10 pence it was accessing you to billions of pounds of infrastructure the world over you could call the mayo clinic on that telephone line and then there was you know about 15 years later i enrolled actually at the medical school next door to that uh, hospital at ucl in london um, and i was the only student there with a mobile phone and people used to think why, why has this crazy kid got a mobile phone what would you use that for what a crazy device they actually thought i had taken the phone from home and, and taking it with me for the day. They couldn't believe that with this little digital cell phone, I can make telephone calls. But I actually had no um, reason to have that phone because it was really expensive. And how, how I'd managed to get it was I'd convinced my brother, who was a surgeon, a veterinary surgeon. I was living above a vet surgery at the time, um, helping him and um, you know while I was at college. And um, it was this incredible thing that he could see the value of the, of the mobile phone um, because it would um, help him when he was out of hours. The alternative back then was a series of pages, ads and machines. I'm sure you remember it yourself, John, those days. Um, and literally, there was me in a library, which I've since gone back and lectured in, that had no internet connection in my library at medical school. And now when you go back there, there are no books. There are just screens on desks. Um, but the incredible step is that still I'm gobsmacked at how slow we are to adopt technology. So in, in the UK, the GPs, the Royal College of GPs, Got a global reputation for training, you know, the family doctors, the best family doctors in the world. Yet when you go to your MRCGP exam, you are immediately fail if you actually bring a mobile phone into the exam. Yet every single mobile uh, patient in the waiting room has got the latest smartphone in their pocket. 
every doctor is not going to work a day of their future career without the equivalent of something like an iPhone 7 in their pocket. Yet we're making these people not use this incredible cyborg technology, as Elon Musk calls it. You know, we're, all, we're already cyborgs, whether we accept it or not. Why aren't we letting our doctors use these superpowers? And so part of my mission in starting a company that lets you video call a doctor was also to help other doctors realize how we can actually use, use these superpowers. Um, and I developed a, the first course, CPD course for doctors, to teach them about mobile healthcare. I provided that to um, very esteemed colleagues at events like the World Diabetes Congress in Vancouver, in Turkey uh, several times, um, Istanbul. Um, literally, I've gone around the world learning from people about how to use mobile technologies in their markets um, and also sharing the insights that I get from that with, with other clinicians because I think it's time we you know, moved on from stamping stuff on dead trees um, and started using these um, incredible technologies that are already the tools of our time. You know? it's, nothing, it's nothing groundbreaking, this stuff anymore, so it's, it's a really good thing. But the incredible thing I'm seeing is that not only is, um, is, is all digital technologies are converging to mobile phones, but also we're seeing this incredible thing where mobile phones are going inside other technologies. So you have this thing that's called the Internet of Things. And it's literally the um, Internet is evolving from something that we uh, maneuver around with a cursor or a, a mouse and click on things to something which actually the things interact in our machines. So things like embedded glucometers or um, ECG machines with our own connectivity. What's the huge value that can come from that data insights? But unless we start all using our mobile phones as clinicians and letting patients use their phones with us, none of these things will be able to re realize their potential. So that's my biggest concern and my you know, biggest passion for making sure that we all um, get on board and learn about this fascinating new mass media, which is mobile, the most uh, misunderstood, newest mass media. Um, most people just think it's a device in their pocket and they don't realize it's as big as the TV or the, the printed press with Gutenberg. We've got this new mass media. It's just very misunderstood at the moment. Um, and there's a huge uh, wealth of potential that we can get when we understand it and utilize it. You, you know, Dave, we're, we're kind of in a similar situation with Hangouts. We, we have a hard time convincing a lot of, a lot of doctors just to get on the Internet to talk, uh, to talk about whatever subject. Uh, some people seem to be afraid of the video screen almost. And I'm sure you started from the very beginning. Like the iPhone came around, what, 2007, 2008? Was that the first year? No, we were launched before that. Actually, in Europe, we had video calls uh, back in 2006. As soon as they launched video calls, we had this service live. We launched it as the Royal Society of Medicine in November 2006. So you've been battling the whole way, kind of like to convince well, it's a battle, physicians to use it. Look at the adoption. That, um, we, we, we came from a physician side. So my business yeah. partners are all physicians. They're GPs with their own practices and bricks and mortar. So um, you know, we, we didn't have to challenge. Patients want this stuff. Um, all we had to do was patients tell patients we were there and make sure the service we were providing was safe. Um, we did a bit of design to the service with 3G Doc that's worth filling in on. Um, essentially what happens is the patient goes online, completes an interactive medical history questionnaire. That was actually developed initially in America by a company called Primetime Medical. The product's called Instant Medical History. It was validated several years ago by Professor John Buckman, who's the primary care professor at Mayo Clinic. And it's just an, an incredible opportunity for patients to have their own time given their history. Literally, patients... When given a blank email page or a page, we'll write 10 pages or two lines. You know, the things that are relevant aren't always, uh, patients aren't always aware what they are. But it also gives them time to consolidate their thoughts and share things like how they feel. Things like depression scalings and stuff that you'd be familiar with consultant psychiatrists using. Patients can actually fill this stuff in themselves. And I see doctors complaining all the time that patients waste their time. The incredible thing we have is we have... Um, Huge, you know, over half of the time a U.S. doctor is spending is on clerical work. You know what? Patients are interested in doing that. They can do that, and they've got the tools in their pockets to do it. So mm -hmm. it's time we started letting patients give that history. But also that provides an opportunity for the doctor not just to be some sort of drone asking for questions of patients, but go straight into really try and help patients with their information. And so if we twin that with other stuff like 
you know, you, you've seen a website. I mean, seriously, 2017, we have patients who go to their doctor and try and share a web page. And the doctor's like laughing at them, thinking that this is the most stupid thing that they're ever going to do. What, look up a YouTube video of the patient. Whereas, because our service is completely online, we don't have the bricks and mortar. We don't have any, um, any problem about discussing online content with patients. And just that alone, you know, and I've seen an awful lot of companies come up in the meantime doing video consults. And what they often try and do is the very difficult prescribing part of the doctor role, not actually helping people with information. So most patients are getting interrupted within 18 seconds of, of coming in the door and starting to talk to the, patient, to the doctor. And here we have an opportunity for the patients to give all the history that they find it important. At the end, they get a free text box where they can share websites, you know, extra information. But the doctor gets that in quite a concise format before they actually do the video call. It means that the patient doesn't pick the doctor. This is how we say it. But the doctor picks the patient. So we have a doctor looks at the output from the instant medical history and says, that would suit this doctor best to call that patient. Some of the things we find that actually aren't going to be suited to our type of call. And what we can do with those is instead of charging the patient for that consult, we can actually give them a, 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 a null fee and we can just say, look, go to your family doctor with this printout report. It will make a lot of sense. And what the patient finds is that when they go to the doctor, they've got a letter from another doctor and they can actually start considering this information. And then when the doctor sees this history printed out for them, you know, you've done their job for them. Um, so it, it also means the continuity of care. When we've seen a patient, the patient's got a written report from us. So immediately after the consult, the doctor will write his notes and then you can just log in and download the PDF or share it or whatever. Um, but you get what you shared, um, the questions, the answers, the, the things that have been indicated, the free text box you filled, and you get the doctor's uh, small uh, written report on the bottom of that. And what that means is that it supports continuity of care. When you go to see the next person, you don't have to repeat it all. So you'll see with telephone lines or you know, in those insurance paid for uh, video call services, the patient has to go back to another doctor and tell them all the things they said on the video call or the telephone call. And that's really ineffective because most doctors just go, hey, cut the, just tell me why you're here. And yeah. so you might have spent half an hour talking to the video doctor, but because it lacked documentation, you have this, um, you have this disconnect and it just doesn't support continuity care. It also doesn't support going back and looking at stuff. So we also look to follow up with patients to say, how did that advice go? So we can learn from it so we can monitor how well we're doing um, and that just wouldn't be possible if we were if the content we were looking at was a 10 minute recording of a video call so the documentation is very important you know that's a real key message with with the mobile phone everything's documented you know every website you've been on it, this company like google and facebook they have all this data but you know patients have that data shared with all these big tech companies but when they go to the doctor, they walk in and it's all new. Who are you? What do you do? And it's just quite incredible that we just don't have data sharing. One of the first things that's needed to enable that is that we move care from the old way of doing it, where it was undocumented, and you sort of try to remember what the doctor said, to this fully documented uh, way, um, which also helps the doctors be concise and also helps them learn from data, the inf information that's being shared. Uh, but on top of that instant medical history, you can now add things like the live core ECG readings, data that you can capture with your phone. And so more and more increasingly, you're going to see diagnostic staff with bespoke questionnaires that, that go into that. So we're working with a pediatrician in Harley Street. He's probably the most experienced pediatrician in, in Europe. Uh, his name's Professor Sam Lingham, um, Harley Street Pediatric Chambers. And we've taken, this, this guy wrote in the seventh air, uh, I think it was 79, he was giving all his patients at Great Ormond Street access to their patient notes. And another doctor looked at this and thought, what is this bizarre doctor doing? And so he wrote a paper, like this experiment, a weird doctor, and what he's doing. And today he uses, what he found is he had these cues going out the door of parents who just didn't have the time to sit with every one of them and take a history. So he made a very basic questionnaire. It ended up about that fat with paper, all the history from the parents, from the grandparents. A lot of it was genetic history that today people are thinking you have to run to 23andMe and companies like that for. But actually, you can get most of this information by asking specific questions of parents, you know, um, things like 
how babies were delivered there. And he's produced all this, and we're putting that questionnaire into the incident medical history and also um, developing the service for him. So it's not just really basic stuff. What we find is that we can actually manage some of the most complex, difficult to diagnose patients that are, you know, that exist. Patients have ding-donged around doctors without documentation, but when they actually take the time, breathe deeply, and complete their questionnaire, they can give the best history they've ever given, you know? That's yeah, I, do you think, I, I, it seems probably no accident that Google seems to have access to a lot of NAS, NHS records, correct? I think they gave it all. <laughs> I think at some point they've, they've given it all. We'll probably find out in the future that it's all. Yeah, it's, it's funny. They seem to be making more headway in, in England with access to patient records than they are in America. Yeah, it's quite contentious. And it's been a great paper published by some legal team, uh, a, a great lawyer who's working at Cambridge University. Fabulous paper where DeepMind went into a hospital on a very small app they were making. They call it DeepMind, but it's owned by Google. So it's mm -hmm. the AI part of Google. And they went into um, the Royal Free Hospital and Trust, and they said, we'll do this app for patients who are on dialysis. But it turned out, months down the line, that someone found out and Freedom of Information Access revealed that actually they're given access to patients going back 10 years. Mm -hmm. going, no, going forward 10 years and back six, which is just literally half of North London's patient group who've ever been in that trust or out of that trust. And they've got all their medical records for this very small requirement. So it just doesn't seem to apply. The sort of things that they stop clinicians like you, John, doing because they say, oh, there's privacy things, they don't apply to Google. And anyone, no one's big enough or brave enough to actually take on Google mm -hmm. because it's obviously got this you know, uh, swinging door between a lot of the people working in the senior management and major tech companies like Google or Uber we will be moving in and out of PR jobs at, at, the, at Downing Street, you know. So you find that there's, um, but you know what, is it going to be that bad? Uh, we're going to have to learn very quickly. But, you know, squirreling away all these records like the NHS has been doing for years and posting it through the postal system on, in CDs and stuff, that's also not good, you know. So we should really welcome some of these tech companies, but we should, you know, make sure that they're very visible and... Um, you know, they should apologize when they, when they make mistakes like this. Because clearly, those millions of patients who went into that trust never gave consent for a company that sells advertising for a business to get their medical records. And as privatization of the NHS is surely coming in, this is going to have um, huge value for companies like Google because, you know, the insurers will pay for this information all day. Yeah. Well, going back to your uh, um, clerical a percentage of clerical work. It's funny. I just saw a statistic today, like that says exactly what you said. In the in the USA, doctors say that they spend fifty percent of their time uh, cleric, doing clerical work with a patient. Uh, would you say that that percentage is a little better with your GP service? I think you know what we've got to do is realize that the most underutilized resource in the whole healthcare yeah. domain is the patient. They've got the capacity, they've got the interest in getting this information correct. Do you know, yeah. whenever they reveal patient records to patients, they always go, oh, that's completely wrong. Oh, that wasn't me. What are you talking about? How's it? And so, why hasn't that conversation... Right? It keeps going on and on. Yeah, and it just, a lot of this is building on, oh, I thought you were a patient with dialysis. No, that's not me. That's, uh, do you know, how did that get in my record? Uh, so, first of all, we've... Can you imagine if people's bank accounts were run in such a way that only the bank manager could have a look at, your, at what was going on? Your, we'd be all out of pocket. We'd be broke on the road, you know? So, yeah, we've, we've just got to move beyond this. And there's been some really good pioneers in this. In the UK, there's a fabulous guy called Dr. Amir Hanan. Everyone should follow this guy and support him because he's just been groundbreaking. He took over a surgery that had been previously run by Dr. Harold Shipman. Um, this is the doctor who got struck off. Um, he was um, convicted of killing a lot of his patients. And he really got away with it because they didn't have visibility of the health care records. So he was killing a lot of elderly patients. The children couldn't see really what was going on, what medications were being prescribed. And so when he went into that practice as a new GP taking over, obviously there was this huge lack of trust with the doctor who had obviously killed lots of people. Um, and he came in and literally opened up the medical records. These are yours. Mm -hmm. And I think it's when you get really harrowing situations like that 
that things like this just stop. You can't keep going on the way you have. But actually, the way he's been practicing, he also used instant medical history with his patients. Because when you find patients can see medical records, immediately they want to talk, they have questions. And immediately, as a smart doctor, you can provide more value because okay. you, you can see all the stuff that was done before and you can see why the patient's got these concerns. And literally, our job has got to evolve into more guiding patients towards better information. It's no longer good enough just to complain that patients are looking up the wrong things on the internet. This is our opportunity to be like the librarian and post them, signpost them to the, to the good resources. And loads of that comes, knowing those resources comes from having the medical records, by seeing what's wrong with the patient, by seeing the history the patient's presenting, the concerns the patient have, you can point them the content. And we've actually had patients use our service that we just pointed to a YouTube video. And when I've shown this to doctors, they say, what, you didn't call the patient, you said, well, check out this video, and if you still want to consult, we, we can do that. And the doctors were just amazed. And then you realize, this is the biggest unmet opportunity. Our medical schools aren't teaching future doctors how to share content with patients. And many of the older doctors scratch their head and the tutors will scratch their head and say, but you know, they could look that up on YouTube anyway themselves. And you say, yeah, but it's given by you. This is the difference between finding a drug on the internet and being prescribed a medicine yeah. by a doctor. It's yeah. the same thing with digital content. With, you know? And so we have to teach this, bake this right into how, how we teach these uh, medical students. And the sad thing is, I go to medical students today, and they are sitting in their anatomy room looking at dumb pieces of printed paper, just like I did over 20 years ago. And it just, it's a disgrace. But one of the things I find is, there's, uh, so I was in Edinburgh University long back, and I was watching these, and there was a population of girls who all had iPads, iPad minis and iPads, and they all had 3D for medical all downloaded. And I went up and I talked to them, and I found they'd all bought these themselves. They hadn't been, you know, and these, you know, lecturers, you cannot be a professor of anatomy and be thinking that somehow, you know, teaching people on printed pieces of paper is a 2017 thing to do, you know. Children are growing up today thinking nothing of pressing a few buttons on this thing here and getting a car come and pick them up or food delivered or next day delivery of an ECG machine they can stick on the back of their phone. <laughs> it's a different yeah. world. We have to live in that world because we're supposed to care for patients in that world. So generally medicine is kind of slow in acceptance of the digital world, you think, you feel... A little bit slow, but you know, there's, there's, there's elements where it really boosts. And one of the other things I'm working on is, um, because my background was in veterinary medicine, we had um, electronic healthcare records in the veterinary surgery 15 years ago. Um, so the weird thing is in the NHS, the head of cancer, Mac Macmillan Cancer Trust, found that her child who had a serious medical condition and was being seen by a number of hospitals, had no access to medical records. And the two different NHS hospitals couldn't access her healthcare records the same record um, but then she phoned up uh, out of hours vet who I know and I know the person who also put his electronic healthcare record in over 10 years ago and she was surprised her little puppy dog had fully electronic records accessible from anywhere on an iPad um, so we can learn from other pieces of medicine so I did a lecture recently at the Royal Veterinary College in London talking about how we should have one medicine you know all these antibiotics that we're We've got this problem with in medicine. Half of it's an animal problem anyway. So we've mm -hmm. got to start looking at a much bigger picture and also learning why. Why have they been able to innovate that? And what I normally find is that the veterinary human medicine difference is a perfect sniff test for if something's irrelevant and just there for sort of political reasons. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these EHR conferences you can go to, you can actually spend literally about nine, ten months of the year touring around going to EHR events. They don't have that in veterinary medicine at all. They would laugh at you. They laugh at a lot of the things that the human medicine doctors do. Um, so we can learn from that. There are differences, clearly, but we have to realize that the reason why that is is because the politicians and the big data companies are doing other things with the data and human beings. We have to stop that, you know. And this is how we're going to make a lot of these uh, very tr um, opaque company uh, operations like pharmaceutical industry it's how we're going to make it clear. So this is the opportunity for doctors to actually clean up their industry and really add value to what they're offering. 
can start working better with patients, more direct, taking out the middleman, because half that time you're spending on the clerical bit of that EHR. That was an uh, American surgical. We must have both seen that same tweet. There was an event on today. But we, um, half that time must be just serving some sort of, um, you know, insurance company need or something like that. So we're serving other masters as doctors today. And this yeah. is our opportunity to get right back. And that's what we do at 3G Doctor. There's no insurance company involved. It's an independent, impartial doctor. We try and style it more like your uncle or auntie who's a doctor and how they would talk to you. Mm -hmm. So we say, you know, you might meet them at a dinner party at Christmas or something. And you say, hey, Uncle Chris, uh, I've got this, this. But Uncle Chris doesn't pull out drugs from his pocket. Uncle Chris doesn't sell you something. Uncle Chris gives you a note and says, go to your doctor and say this, say this, say this. And when you go to your doctor, you say, you know, my uncle Chris, he's a, he, uh, he's a neurologist in, in Cambridge, and he told me to say this to you. That's the sort of thing. We don't, we don't want to replace a family doctor. We're trying to, we know that that's the best place, but so many young people particularly have lost that, and so many older people can't connect to that. You know? And uh, we've had patients who a, a parent has had a stroke, and they've called their GP or gone to the GP's office to talk about their parents care and the GP says oh no privacy I can't talk to you and they say well, do you want me to bring my mum who you know had a stroke in here and they say well that has to happen oh, and so boy. we just have this completely bizarre thing whereas with us if they want to talk to someone they can tell us my mum's had a stroke this is her age this is what's happening this and they can do the video call with her with them and we can have the call or they can have it on their own because we're going on what they say is the information and that's a really weird thing we've let this uh, big clerical job also mm -hmm. disrupt our ability to actually care for people mm -hmm. which is even more concerning than wasting half of our time okay Dale, let's let's see if the students the students have any questions or comments i have a question yes go ahead Steve. thank you very much it's very interesting to hear and i'm happy to to hear about the uh can we call it interoperability in that uh, one of the some of the hangouts we've had is the difficulty in the states uh, the computer systems cannot talk with each other um, systems that don't communicate with each other and so I would like to see uh, this change would be wonderful to be able to, to do this another thing I was thinking about is um, that you are using video um, I was working for a company uh, for a couple of years uh, where I, as a psychologist uh, I, I was using text only to communicate with with clients and uh, the idea of bringing video uh, came up but we never got to that point and I was wondering uh, firstly do you have a text-based uh, uh, system if for example people for people in remote areas that may not have video capability and uh, well who who is able to use video thank you Yes, yeah, so a great point. Um, text is obviously the way people feel better sharing information. That actually comes through in the pre uh, pre consult care that we provide through the questionnaire. So when you go on the questionnaire, it'll ask you things about how you're feeling. Have you? Uh, do you suffer from depression? How long have you felt depressed? For well, all those questions, which it can feel literally a day asking patients questions like that, and send any sane doctor in need of care themselves. So it can take that history from the patient before the consult starts. So you're starting with that as the prerequisite. In terms of the video, most 98% you know, plus of the U UK Irish population where we are only registered to provide care for. So you have to be a GMC, an Irish Medical Council registered doctor to provide our services, part of the insurance crime, as I'm sure you're familiar. So we don't see patients outside of that region. I should have stated that very clearly at the beginning. That's purely because of insurance reasons. Things are changing on that, but it's a long game. Um, what, what we find, though, is that we can always fall back to the voice call. You register for our service using your mobile phone number. So we have your, your mobile number. So we text you before we call, and we call you on your number. And if you can, ac if you can accept a video call, then you're fine. If you can't, likewise, if you've got Wi-Fi and you choose to have it on a FaceTime call, we can we can do it so you can be out in a rural area as long as you've got mm. broadband connection this wonderful so, i mean if i could just throw in one more thing i mean i live in tokyo and uh we have something come out uh last year called pocket doctor and that's a video based uh 
similar system, I think, um, if I'm catching you right. But what we're finding is that the uh, younger people are, they're onto it, but people who are maybe even into their well, 40s, 50s are a little bit behind in the technology. How can we train them to be ready to use this and to accept it? Uh, in Japan, they're very afraid of, of privacy, they, maybe how they look on the phone, perhaps even. Uh, how do you prepare the, uh, the patients for the experience? Yeah, like I say, innovation happens very differently in different countries. And we've had in Japan an incredible thing where, um, you know, eight, this is five-year-old data, but 80% plus of senior OAPs, old age pensioners in Japan today use the mobile data services. So they just think of it as, you know, they'll play cart rider with their kids. It's like the Koreans. Okay. Um, but in some of these markets, it's completely illegal. Mm -hmm. So... Mm -hmm. When you, when you sit there going, why are Samsung and LG completely missing out on the innovation that mm. Apple are doing with research kit and some of the you know, health kit yeah. stuff? It's because it's literally illegal in their country. So when they come nice. over and they see people doing it here, they go, we, we could do that as like a research project in a hospital. Well, we, we couldn't do that with real people. Um, mm. And so it, it, this looks really experimental because of their mindset, because of, like you say, the right. legislation, the privacy and stuff. So it's a restriction. I once saw LG's big rollout of a telemedicine project, mm -hmm. and they had 50-inch. They showed me all the data on this. They said, can you help us make sense of some of this stuff? And they had 50-inch screens on the walls of the people's homes, and they let yeah, a video call the GP who was around the corner. And I was like, yeah. okay, yeah. what healthcare yeah. content did you put on the screen? And they were like, oh, we didn't put any content on. And I was like, well, what were they going to discuss? And so it's that disconnect. You know, if you don't have content to discuss with the person remotely, if you don't have access to your medical records, none of this really starts being valuable. Mm -hmm. um, you might as well just walk, and they've got a very high uh, GP per head of population, so it's actually quite easy to go around and see the GP you know. But, um, you know, sometimes your GP isn't accessible, sometimes you're not registered with a GP, mm -hmm. sometimes you're bed bound and you can't get to the GP, so that's where, but every country seems to have its own unique little reasons why this hasn't taken off. But Korea, I mean, the powerhouse for all these devices, Japan, powerhouse, they've got this legislation which has stopped it. In Russia, they've just recently done a telemedicine bill and it's for the first time become legal. And I'm over there next week trying to get some findings to find out how we can learn from that, what other countries. But literally, Japan's really good because you've prioritized the, the, you know, the responsibility society has to seniors. Mm -hmm. For some reason, this disconnect has happened. Um, but yeah, we have to we have to learn from every and bring mm, it back and say. So one of the things we're seeing. In, uh, so I, I've written a blog post about how to teach your senior to use text messaging mm -hmm. because we don't have that thing in Japan. In Japan, you can go in a, a phone shop and there's a seventy year old there working, and his job is a sort of. And you nod, but the rest of the people. When I tell that to doctors in the UK mm. and Ireland, they're like, "What? They're like spotty mm. young people in phone shops." Yeah, um, and it's that completely different uh, thing. But we mm. can learn from them, and they can learn from us. And that's really where I've taken it a lot with the M Health Insight blog, and with the LinkedIn M Health group. You know, there's eight thousand members on there. There's loads from Japan. Um, but yeah, I go into I, I, I see the companies entity Como, um, and I see the stuff they're doing, and it just baffles me. Yeah, because they just you. come from a completely different out. perspective. Well, but they've done you. cool things. They've done cool things. They've done some. Um, mm, but you would think with Samsung level. Hospital, with Samsung mm -hmm. Hospital, Samsung should be able to have a healthcare platform, but they've just mm -hmm. completely um, missed it. Mm -hmm. You know, we've had a really hard time getting doctors on to do hangouts, Dave. Uh, we haven't had one. We've we've tried to get Japanese neurosurgeons, Korean doctors, but so far no success. It'll take time, I think, in those countries. And, and you, Simon, you say it's because the culturally. They just, uh, the, the oriental people don't like to get in front of the camera? Um, it's that and also yeah, privacy issues. They're very afraid. Uh, Skype, they're afraid. You can't, I can't get doctors on Skype or well, even individuals. Uh, they feel very worried about the privacy issues in Japan. It's a very okay. huge thing. But it is changing. It is changing. So I expect we're going to be seeing acceptance and this. There's new laws. Uh, there was a law a few years ago passed uh, for remote care people in the country will be able to communicate there was a company called Curly um, uh, we were trying to make uh, 
some headwind, but it just didn't t didn't take. It just wasn't ready. But uh, it's going to happen. So I'm looking okay. forward to that. Very good, Diana or Ezra. Do you have any questions or comments? Yeah, I do. Um, first of all, David, thank you so much. I love the talk. I love you. It's a great uh, field that you're interested in. I love it too. Um, I've got three questions. If you can answer them quickly, um, that'll be fine. Or sh in, in short, really. Um, so, first question is: So you you mentioned a really interesting point uh, that the patients don't pick the doctors on your platform. How do the doctors uh, choose what patients they can, uh, you know, um, offer consultations to on your platform? Uh, so that that's done on an individual basis. What we find is triage is done by healthcare organisations today, with the least experienced person trying to do it. So when you ring up the NHS's one 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 service, they literally have a school leader who's reading a script off a screen, and actually that's where you should have your most experience. So it's a completely counterintuitive thing, but if you gave a medical history to someone like John, he could look at it in seconds and say, that's what we need to do with that patient. That's the type of doctor that would bear up. First priority we've got is which doctor we've got available for the patient. You know, we have to be realistic about who, who's going to make the call. But the second thing is, you get a very good feel for it. You know, some people, you want to talk about something emotional. Who's your doctor who's really good at emotions? Um, you've got someone who's got an immediate thing they need to do. Who's the best internet research? Who's the best? The skills that doctors have, and that's what we look for um, when we're recruiting. It's trying to develop those skills in doctors, but also find ones who've got a natural interest. One of my doctor colleagues, the uh, reason I just fell at his feet was because he had a, a sign in his waiting room which said the most uh, a prize for the patient, the most interesting thing they found on the internet this week. Right? And that was just like, right, you are the type of doctor who needs to be doing this service. So if a patient then found some big protracted argument on Mumsnet, a website about, you know, where they might discuss issues affecting young mums, that doctor would be just the ideal one to chuck in on that. Because there's all these opinions, there's all these, does this work, does this work, what about this nutrition, probiotics, are they a buzzy thing or are they real? I don't know, but put savvy doctors who've been around a while and heard all the sales pitches um, and then get to the bottom of this stuff really quickly and help patients ex explain that. So, so it's, it's really dependent on what the patient comes through on an instant medical history report and that's the best way of doing it in our situation. But many of the times you just go, you know what, you can go straight to your family doctor. They don't have one, so you know you, you manage it, and you really try and work with that patient to make sure they do that, take that first interaction. So the doctors on your platform will pick the patients they want to treat, or do they get one at random to look at? So we'll have a doctor always on who will screen the, the, the outputs of the instant medical history questionnaire. It comes through to us, we see it, and we go, who would you put that to? Okay. Uh, and so it's an individual by individual basis. Who's who's available tonight? You know, if if you're working for us in Dublin and you're on available, and I say oh, I've got a patient and he's got blood in his urine, yeah. yeah, I'm sure you can handle that. You know, get on with it. Mm -hmm. um, but if we see something where, you know, it's someone who's got uh, many of the people come into the questionnaire and end up with a completely different. You know, they often start with a keyword and then end up answering questions on a completely different issue. And some of them can be really sensitive issues. And so the patient might have come in with that start on the branch, but the, these are interactive questionnaires and it, they might lead to something else. And then you might need someone who's a bit more gifted emotionally. And um, you'll just say, look to the patient, uh, do you mind if you know we call you in an hour? Um, we've got Dr. Kavanaugh who's, who's, who's going to be available then, and I think she'd be really suited to this. Or we've got a doctor who sees this all the time. And we, yeah. we schedule you to see to talk to that doctor. Because yeah. um, you know, once once you've done a few patients the same, you can get really good and you can learn. Um, and, and because doctors spend so little time in training and experience dealing with things on the internet, which is mostly what we're doing, mm -hmm. um, you find doctors just get more talent at doing certain things and like doing certain things. I think doctors should really be encouraged to do things they like doing. So often I see the morale in doctors is so low. 
Uh, you know, we've got young mum doctors and we're dragging them out and telling them we're working hospital shifts of 12 hours and two hours driving there and back. And it's just ridiculous. Why are we letting this incredibly talented human person, you know, force fitting them into this, this job structure? Because we can't imaginatively think, you know how many home workers there are in UK and Ireland? There's millions. But there's no home working doctor opportunity offered to any graduate in medicine at Trinity. Silly isn't it? Crazy. Yeah, I know. Crazy. There's all of us sitting here talking away. <laughs> Every doctor in the country's got a mobile smartphone in their pocket, yeah. but no one's ever talked to them about you. So what we have is we have them leaving the career in droves. You know? And here we have an opportunity to be home workers. Yeah. Doctors should be, we should have, I keep saying we, we should have M health units t teaching people in, in medical schools. And the medical schools should be, oh, yeah, we're, I'm going to work from home. Where, where are you going to work from home? Oh, on my veranda in Australia. And I'm going to see patients in the UK. I'm going to have my feet up. I'm going to be dealing, and I'm going to have the best, like TripAdvisor reviews. People are going to say, I'm brilliant at this. Um, I'm going to raise my family. I'm going to have this fantastic life. And I'm going to really add value to patients who are struggling with stuff. Um, but instead, what we have is, and I, I write about this stuff on my blog, I, I write about a doctor who wrote a paper in a broadsheet newspaper in the UK, in, I believe it was The Guardian, who wrote about how he scheduled a suicidal uh, woman for a, patient, for a consult at something like 9 o'clock in the morning and then complained that the patient was late. Why would you be scheduling patients who are suicidal? And the reason why the patient was suicidal, he revealed in The Guardian article, was that the patient didn't have much money. Well, I bet the patient might have money if they've got to sit all weekend worrying about their life and then somehow make it to a thing first thing on Monday morning. Uh, what, take off work? I'll be even more financially out of pocket. This, this is this bizarre world when you think everything must be force-fitted into an office visit. You know, that's, that's the change. We've had 2,000 years of learning how to perfect office visit only model. We have to change. The mobile phone is the device to make us change. So it's hard. We've got to learn. We've got to share everything we do widely. Um, you know, initially when I started this business, the doctors used to say to me, oh, David, you're going to give all your ideas away. Giving ideas away is the, the value you get. It's how I end up marketing my company, but also I meet with people like you, John, the people that are watching this. Um, that's the value. So if you've got value to give, start giving it away. The, you know, there's a company in Japan just started up doing this. You know, 10 years ago, people were saying we were mad doing this, that no patient would ever want to do it, that we'd never be able to recruit a single GP to do this. So sharing information has been the route to us recruiting, to us making money, you know, keeping this as a profitable venture, um, and, 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 and developing this entire business. In the future, most of our work will be remotely done with patients. Uh, so we have to realize we're going there. You have a training program, correct, for healthcare professionals learning health, M Health? Yeah, so I produced that for the Health Informatics Society there in Dublin. They're next to the American Embassy. They also uh, they're part of the Irish Computer Society, and that's this really progressive organisation that uh, produced a European computer driving license. And when the founder of the, the inventor of the European computer driving license, which is this really enabling thing for people to learn how to use IT proficiently, um, about 20 million European citizens have already done it. Uh, when they saw what we were doing, they said, you know, we need this as a course. We need a course that can teach people how to start using, because literally IT companies are going into hospitals saying, hey, we've got this iPad project. You buy it for a million, you know, gazoobal million pounds. And then what we'll do is we'll train your staff how to use it. And what actually happens in IT firms is they think that they are being paid to train the staff to use their app, not to use the technology. And literally, mobile phones have been invented and deployed so quickly, it's imagine like an ambulance or a helicopter, right, was invented in the last five years. And we were just giving staff keys to the ambulance or keys to the helicopter and going, go off and pick a patient up. You know, we don't do any tests to see whether the nurse is competent, whether the porter is competent, whether the doctor knows how to use this. 
and we beat doctors up all the time because they use things like WhatsApp to share a picture of an X-ray. You know, they did a survey in the UK how many the doctors work in NHS hospitals because the IT systems were so buggy and expensive and just hard to use and inter uninterconnected. They were using WhatsApp to take a picture of this, the, the X-ray and send it to their friend. And then they said, oh, this is terrible. You're all doing this. The NHS clamped down on it. And you're thinking, no, no, no. You need to train them how to do these things. And so it's like you train people how to drive the ambulance. Train, tra train people to use the most powerful tool you've ever put in your hand. Why not? Because the upside of it is that you have people who get much more value from that device. So in a mobile healthcare course that we do, we've done it for a bespoke area on cardiology, the Irish Cardiac Society. We did it for diabetes, the World Diabetes Congress. But I mean, I think you're, you're working in such a great area, John, that's why I'm so keen to help you because I went to the World Diabetes Congress, a biannual event, the biggest event in the world diabetes industry, ran by the International Diabetes Federation. And they flew patients from all over the world to come this on bursaries. And when the patients got there and started tweeting pictures that were taken of the slides, they were told off by the organizers. <laughs> Incredible, huh? Imagine what an insult. You've flown from Brisbane to Vancouver. You're trying to help all the other diabetic patients. And you're like, wow, what are they doing? You know, they're insulting me for doing this. You're getting a slap in the face for doing that. And so what we have here is this, um, you know, this opportunity to tell people to share. Um, and we have to enable these people. So the only hour of content at that entire World Diabetes Congress was the hour that I recorded and put on YouTube. I just find that amazing. Has no one got anything in diabetes they want to share with people? Um, do, do we not see that we shouldn't be doing the same conference every two years? We should say, that's been said. That's been done. Let's move yeah. forward. And this is what content like this does. It says, there's that. That's been said. We can't keep saying that every year. Yeah. Because you can watch that on YouTube. That's done. We need to use that collective intelligence, move everyone on. And I think that's what you're in a really unique place to do with this internet medicine. You've got, you know. I'm glad you feel that way, Dave. You know, uh, I could understand when, when I was talking to a group of, of, uh, of physicians and PhDs uh, on the internet saying, why don't you just take a smartphone to a conference and interview people? And they looked at me like I was crazy. They said, wait a minute, you, you have an excellent camera a, a means of communication from a place where people would like to be at a conference talking to the guy that just presented. I mean, what's the huge change in mindset that has to take place for people to do that? It's taken out of them. It's taken out of you for your training. You know, if I sit you in a desk and I make you copy stuff out of books and learn it, um, you know, if I need you to memorize stuff from books and do exams, Okay, I've taken out of you all the ability you'll have to work in an environment where all that information is on your phone. Mm -hmm. All that information is on the phone in your patient. You know, I say to doctors, have you ever been Googled by a patient? Do your patients use the internet? They go, no. I go in their waiting room, I say, do you know what they're doing? They're Googling you. <laughs> they're writing reviews about you. And they say, where? And I show them on Facebook where they should but some of it is ego. So when you work with, we, we did a really cool project. Uh, it was called Harley Street TV about eight years ago. And it was this really bizarre thing that we found. The way to get doctors interested in this was to say that uh, this is really senior. This is the most successful people in, in European medicine. And we'd say to them, what happens when I Google your name? And we'd show them. And when you Google their name, often it was like a clinic around the corner that was competing with him. The first thing, you know, they'd put the, their Google ad up and he'd say that and he'd say, I'm going to sue them. How dare they do that? And then we'd look down and we'd get page two or something and it was all just rubbish stuff about him, where he's based, old hospitals he worked at and all that. And we'd say, look, do it for your colleague who's already working with us. And you would see a lovely YouTube video of him talking about his specific area, about his expertise, about patients talking about exactly what he does. And that was it. Do you know why they were most interested? We didn't realize. We found that what they were most interested in that for was not the business it would create or how it would do with their peers and stuff like that. It was that they found that their children, when they went to school or went around to friends' houses, they all asked, what does your dad do? And then they would Google them 
and they would be sitting around their friends and their friends would say, uh, Dad, you, there's a thing about you and it's all rubbish, you know. And it was this ego thing where they wanted to be proud of how they look on the internet. So mm-hmm. some of it, you have to say, if I was you, John, I'd just be saying, what's your internet? Look, here's, here's, here's your top 10 on Google when I look at you. You go on internet medicine and do an interview with me, that's going to be the first thing. Plus, you can put that link on your Twitter account and you're good to go. You know, how could they say no to that? Mm-hmm. When you show them, hey, look how bad you look. So I find sometimes you've got to play the, people's <laughs> ego to make them want to do that. But with the young ones, we need to go and train them. It's all about training. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I think the, stu- the students could probably answer this one. I mean, I wish I was a student again, but you must get uh, from day one digital information, how to do things digitally. Is that correct, uh, uh, you guys? Well, you, well, first of all, you guys grew up with, you know, it's a little different with me, uh, Dave. I didn't grow up with computers, but all you guys grew up with computers, and you're very, very adept at Facebook, et cetera, et cetera. Was it an easy transition for all you students to kind of get into the digitalization of medicine? The digital, um, really, I mean, for me, like, once you start um, getting into the Internet young, such as like I started through um, YouTube and Facebook and then automatically because those two platforms become a part of your daily life, anything else would be so much, so much easier to adapt to. Whereas I feel the older people, when they come in, they, they don't come in bound to the internet. They're not bound by Facebook or et cetera. So they're just like basically lost. They don't have their own little home on the internet. Whereas like we've already have our own niche um, where we constantly have visited, you know, click the notification button every day. And mm. the internet sort of becomes home for you, you know, it becomes second nature and everything else is easier to learn. Mm-hmm. In terms of college, um, we only had one project um, in three years. So we've had one this year where they told us to do a study or an, an essay on how, um, on, uh, or about, um, health behavior changing apps and how useful they are, et cetera, mm-hmm. um, which I did uh, about some Chinese app which measures everything. So you, uh, it's called Eye Care Health. Mm-hmm. You put it by one finger behind the camera and one finger in front. It measures your blood pressure, your blood lipids, um, gives you um, your heart rate, um, all Pulse these, bad, all, yeah, your, your SATs, your cell, your oxygen saturation and all of that. And then you can like, you can self monitor. So you, it provides, uh, it puts it into a graph and you can monitor over time. Um, and then it gives you little ways on how to improve on each of them. And it tells you if your, your results are normal or not. Mm-hmm. But then when you come to use the coins, which you get for measuring, the shops in Chinese, so you can't really use the coins or anything. But, oh, okay. Yeah. But, Very but that's it. one essay. Okay, D- Diane, you're being quiet today. You don't have to. You don't have to say anything. But does he have any comments or questions for uh, David? Oh well, I just wanted to say a little bit about the topic that you just mentioned. Um, it's a little bit difficult, kind of growing up in the the internet world and. Having Google right there, you always want to Google search anything for a project or before you start actually finding resources or journals to reference, right, for any kind of paper. And it's difficult growing up in that and then trying to go to school and everything is like out of the book or out of this really old textbook or having to just search and get all your information from there as opposed to utilizing the new tech and the new apps that we have available in medicine. So mm-hmm. I kind of feel like education is definitely a little bit behind in that sense where they're trying to teach us the old way, but we were, we're learning in a totally different environment. So that's, that still occurs, huh? Yeah. Oh, well, well, John, I think that's really still going. Through, through the network that I've got, I get really bizarre things, like students who are on the iPad project uh, using yeah. iPads. So some of the medical schools in the US have just completely thrown out the books, put all printed content on the iPad. Right. You see and these right. students have written to me saying, hey, David, I really like your blog. Um, and I've said, hey, can you give me your app? 
to download. And he said, yeah, yeah, here's my password and everything. Log in, just don't write anything as me. And so I get to see what these students are doing. And when I show this to a student over here, they're like, that's like man from the future. How come he's got all that stuff in, in the iPad? That makes it so easy. And the reality is, it has. And I, I wrote a blog all about this. Basically, it was UC Irving, right? They right. published a paper that showed if you were one of the students that was given the iPad that year, you scored 26% higher. Yeah. So I said, you know what's so funny? If I failed in the US medical school that hadn't got the iPad project, I'd merely take my school, my medical school, to court because it costs you so much money to go to medical school in the US. And I'd say, you failed me. As long as I was within 26% of the pass mark, another medical school has proven that the students perform better. And the reason they perform better is because, you know, when I'm going along with my histology book on the bus, it's hard to get it out in front of people and stuff like that. But I can do the quizzes and all of that on the iPad app. And so it's much easier to fit this with your lifestyle, not break your back carrying every book around, but mm. also use five-minute opportunities to deep dive, go in and do some research. But also a book is better than a book. So one of the things I tell, you know, we've got to get these students using it. And the really sad thing we have in the UK and Ireland is that we still, my medical school was one of the groundbreakers in this, but we still really hit this thing where people has to be, have to be ultimate high achiever. And actually what that does, I'm at a medical school and I always say, get your phones out. Okay, get your other phone out. And no one's got a second phone. None of the students have second phones. And they have rubbish phones. Yeah. And I say, if I went out onto that bus on Tottenham Court Road, the kids have got better phones. And they're kids that aren't at medical school. And do you know why it is? Because they have, these kids are all grade A violin. He can play the clarinet. He can do, and they aren't the sort of, they're the more studious type. And so actually, I think we've got an endemic problem with these young medics coming through. Is that unlike these guys who are all on a hangout tonight, these ones that are coming through, they've got other sort of skills that aren't matching this. So they're not the sort of mobile looking ones. They're not the ones that know how to play the games. Yet, guess what? That's how they're going to do surgery. You know, they're never going to do surgery with these old scalpels and stuff that, um, that you've got experience doing, John. Uh, well, they're going to have to be using robots and understanding how this technology works. So we've got to have, we've got to be picking. Um, my anatomy uh, lecturer told us, go and get a Nintendo Game Boy. So that was at UCL in 1995. He said, go and learn how to play a Game Boy. Um, so that was very insightful. We need people like that now to be saying, you know, every student should come in and should be examined. It's like, you remember maths exams used to be without calculators. If you're old enough, me and John would know that. Mm -hmm. um, but now, it's not like the maths is easier. They do more complex problems with really powerful calculators. You know, they're better engineering bridges and stuff like that because they, they, they trained with that stuff. And we have to look at that as doctors. And that's why I picked up at the, at the beginning that we have GPs literally being failed if they bring a mobile phone into an exam. Oh. Where are they going to be on the moon? They'll have a mobile phone. on. If, they ever, if you ever practice medicine on the moon, you'll have a mobile phone. So why are we telling them they can't use this? Because isn't that what the problem is? You know, Patients want to discuss YouTube videos, something they heard John discussing at Larkin Hosp Community Hospital on the internet on a hangout. And then they're going to a doctor who's sitting there with paper binders and an EHR that no one else can look at. You know, I thought it'd be a done deal, David. When they come out with that study you mentioned about UC at Irvine, about be being 26% better on their exams than their associates who were traditionally trained, I thought it'd be a slam dunk where all the schools would go, oh, wow, let's, let's, let's become iPad-based as far as education. But it hadn't seemed to have occurred, it sounds like. Yeah, 10 years ago, a good friend of mine, Dr. Uh, Henrik Andersen from Swiss Sweden, started a company, and they produced this product called iDoc. And iDoc went into the Welsh deanery, and they stipulated it for every student. And a telephone company gave them all um, the initial iPhones. But before that, they gave them these sort of PDA things that we're using. Mm -hmm. So really early on this. And then... They were just picking the wrong format every year. You'd go, oh, this is the future of you know uh, education. But they kept buying these rubbish Microsoft things. And then Flash wouldn't work. And then the next year, this wouldn't work. And they just kept burying themselves in a hole. Whereas these ones have come in with the iPad and the community of developers that Apple have brought, you know, the best talent in usability, the best talent in 
developing stuff is, is being developed for this iPad. And that's why these things grow like gangbusters. But if you actually get the app, right, so you beg one of those students to give you access to what they're doing, the most groundbreaking things I've ever seen. A uh, really easy example is 3D for medical. Anyone got that? Hands up. No, 3D get, it. One. get it on your face. 3D for medical. They do all these okay. anatomy apps, right? They've got this anatomy app, and what it yeah, allows you to yeah, do is a student. Incredible. Yeah. They incredible. let you uh, play, play the quizzes, right? Multiple choice quizzes, yeah? But it lets you mark scores. And what they, they allow, is they, you can join a Facebook group at your medical school, okay, for your anatomy. And what they now do is they mark the groups on how the group performs. Mm -hmm. And guess what? No other medical school is doing that in the world, right? What happens is they train these people to be individual performers, then they go straight out into the job marketplace, and you've got to work with a team. Now what they're doing, because they've got the iPad thing and the administrative hurdle for the lecture isn't massive, the students can all go in this thing, and they can pick up members of their team who they see need a bit of help in study revision. Instead of waiting to the end of the year where he fails, because his score is part. If we were all in a team, yeah, we'd be doing hangouts and stuff like that. Because if all our marks were helping each other, you know, we'd 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 be motivated to to work as a team. So we have now a tool that allows training of medical students in team-like fashion, and that's the career they're going to have to do. So I, it, it should be a done deal. Yeah. Uh, some of them go, I've got reservations about buying iPads and they're going to play games on it. And you've got to realize if you're at medical school, your motivation isn't to play computer <laughs> games, is it? No. Oh, I don't think so. I don't think so. Well, David, I don't want to keep it too long. You've spent a lot of time. I really appreciate you coming out uh, and all, also to all the students. But could we get a view of the Kerry countryside? <laughs> can, can, he can, likes can, where I live. Can you, okay. can you get a picture from there? Yeah, you can. I'll just open the, open the window. Oh, lovely. Like. There, we, there oh. we go. There's, a, um, there's south, I mean, southwestern Ireland for you. <laughs> wow, lovely. Yeah, that's, lovely. that's the Atlantic there. <laughs> so, it's, did you see it? Yeah. Yeah, oh, beautiful. Beautiful. Did you see the horses and the. <laughs> so that's that's beautiful. Well, I, I hope we do a lot more of these, David. And uh, thanks yeah. again for all the students to come out. I'll end the television part and then we can just chat. So thank you very much. Love you guys. Bye-bye.